went out I didn't get to sleep that night Till the morning came around I said I'd run but I'd take my time Friend of the devil is a friend of mine I get home before daylight I just might get some sleep tonight Ran into the devil And I loaned me twenty bills I spent the night in Utah And I gave up in the hill I said I'd run but I'd take my time A friend of the devil is a friend of mine I get home before daylight I just want to get some sleep tonight Catches up with me, I'll spend my life in jail. Got a wife in Chino, baby, and one in Cherokee. The first one says she's got my child, but it don't look like me. I said I'll run, but I'll take my time. A friend of the devil is a friend of mine. I get home before daylight, I just might get some sleep. Second one is prison, babe Sheriff's on my trail And if he catches up with me I'll spend my life in jail You can borrow from the devil You can borrow from your friend The devil got a twenty dollar bill And your friend only got ten Said I'll run, but I'll take my time A friend of the devil is a friend of mine I get home before daylight I just might get some sleep tonight
Phil Lesh, thanks so much for being with us here at E-Town. Yeah. It's an honor to have you here. No, yeah, it's a pleasure to be here. Yeah. I want to obviously talk to you about, um, about your playing and, and music and your experience as a, as a founding member of the Grateful Dead, but also as a band leader now. But before we do, I want to ask you a little bit about your early influences, because as we many of us know, you um, studied classical composition. You were inspired at an early age by some by Brahms that just blew your mind. Yeah, that's um, all true. Yeah. yeah. Can we talk a little bit about how those things snuck into your way of thinking about music, those, those well, influences. You know, and I'm, when I'm four years old, I, I don't really think about music, you know, much yeah. anymore. I was, but you felt my, it. my big thing was reading, and I, I, I would read to my grandmother, read the Bible to my grandmother, but she, she would listen to the, uh, the, the, I think it was the New York Phil yeah. uh, on Sunday's broadcasts, yeah. uh, you know, and uh, one, one, one Sunday she caught, she, she came out of her room while it was going on, and she looked into my room and she saw that I was sitting on the floor with my ear against the wall, listening to this music. So she ended up, so the next weekend she invited me in to, yeah. to, uh, to hear, the, uh, hear the concert in, in, the, in, in the room with her. And, uh, I, as, as I, I think they played the Brahms First Symphony, and it totally. <laughs> I have to say, it, it changed my life. Yeah. You know, yeah. I, I, it's hard, hard to imagine that for a four-year-old, you know, to, to being that radical. But, uh, and I didn't, I didn't know what it was, uh, or, or how it was done, or anything. I just knew I wanted it. Yeah. I wanted that. Yeah. yeah, that's so cool. I can relate only because when I was five or so, I started playing my parents' records, and my three favorites were, um, one was by Bix Beiderbecke, and I just didn't understand it, but I had a, just a deep affection and a visceral connection yeah. to that music. Yeah. And another was a Mexican trio called Trio Los Panchos that was sort of romantic singing and guitar playing. Oh, and, yeah, yeah. But they, they just, they changed my life also, those sounds at yes. an early age. Yeah. yeah um, and, but I want to also ask about um, composition, because if we think about um, contemporary classical music and composition that you studied and themes and modulation and shifts from major to minor and the mechanics of how that worked must have influenced you as well, don't you think? Well, well yeah, I mean, it, that's, that, it, it just informs how I think, really. Yeah. And so I, I think in terms of developing, a, a, taking a three-note motif and uh, turning it upside down, stretching it, Yeah. Um, compressing it, playing it backwards. Yeah. And, and, uh, and then... It, copying it, but not exactly. Yeah, yeah. And and talk to me about the, the tension, because I think of you as such a melodic bass player. Yeah. But also driving and holding down the the low end in a... There was quite a lot of low, other low end going on on stage, but how did you manage that tension between being so melodic and, and keeping that drive well, I going? Not to, I tried not to... Not to play when the other guys were playing. In other <laughs> words, I tried to try to stagger my entrances so that there's a, there it created a rhythmic uh, relationship yeah. between the kick drum yeah. and the bass. If, if you just play in a, a, along exactly with what the ba the kick drum is doing, it's uh, I mean it's perfectly serviceable, but it, but you, there you are. It's a waste of an opportunity. Yeah. Yeah. I also think about your playing as being, your role in The Grateful Dead as being, to my ear, um, the sort of master listener. Like you were attuned to picking up cues, hints, themes, ideas that from was, the rest of the band 
and then building and helping with the transitions, whether it was going to change the groove or change the mood or even change the song. That yeah. was that was your doing. Yes, uh, well, that, that's it. That, that that was what I felt to be my role, and, yeah. and I, I felt I also felt that that was my forte. Yeah. Well, you did it so well. Um, I told Mike and, Gordon. And that, that's really the result of all those composition studies, such as they were. You know, I th I, I think like a composer. Yeah. And you would well, see. Here, here's this here's this little three note phrase that uh, Garcia just played. What can we do with this? Yeah. And was everybody listening as intently? I do not know. Yeah. I don't know. It sometimes it seemed like yes. Yeah. Indeed, yes, yeah. they were. When every yes, those things, those moments would occur. Yeah. And the, sometimes they would be very long moments. Yeah. And uh, when those moments happen, when the music begins to play itself, um, in fact, uh, <laughs> that just gives me the shivers when I think about it. Yeah. <laughs> well, I have to credit Mike Gordon from Fish, mm -hmm. because I told him we were going to have this conversation. Uh -huh. And he sent me a list of questions uh, did to he? ask you. <laughs> Good. And then he I said, I hope you're using them. I haven't yet, but that was one of them. I, I have his questions here. And he said, um, uh, one of his questions was, when you're in a peak moment, the music playing itself 100%, is there still a fill? Uh-uh. <laughs> no, no there is, there a, is there a person observing and keeping track of there, the experience? Yeah, there, there's the, everybody has a witness. Yeah, it's the, yeah, I think this it's a, it's this little diamond thing way 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 down in your subconscious, yeah. and uh, it, it's it's like it's it's I don't know I think I think I might be recording everything you know, for uh, you know for the afterlife. But um, but uh, as far as as far as the persona, yeah, yeah, uh, the, the mask uh, the, that we wear right. when we're walking around the street, yeah, that's gone. Yeah. Yeah. There's only the music, right? <laughs> yeah, and when that happens, it doesn't need to happen that often because it's, no, it's so it's, deeply moving that you're going to chase that for the rest of your life. And and and. Uh, that's the thing about music, it is infinite. So it's like the Zeno's paradox, you can chase it your whole life, but you can never quite get there. Yeah. But it's, of course, as we know, the journey yeah. that has the meaning. There's another one that leads me to another one of Mike's questions. Ah. Um, you've spoken about eternal forces, such as God or the gods being the source of music. What steps do you need to facilitate that and to get yourself out of the way? Oh, it's not, it's, it's, it's not, it's not something you can, it's not like quite like getting into character. Right. For a, for a drama, but it's, it's sort of similar. You, so, you sort of have to get out of character, that is to say, get out of yourself. So I, I try before the, before the, the show, just right before the show, I try to just be by myself. And just go blank. Just go absolutely blank. And sometimes I'm successful at doing that, and sometimes I'm not. Yeah. And Do you practice that other other times too? I mean, is that a sort of a discipline, spiritual it's, discipline? It's, it's it's something that I'm learning to use as yeah. a, as a tool in ordinary life, if you will. Yes, as well. Yeah, and being a bass player also. I mean, from my perspective. Um, I share that commitment to listening and serving the moment, but it feels like a, both a service gig and an um, incredibly powerful role. Um, to, yeah, it's, it's an honor. Yeah. It's an honor That's right. for, to play this role. Yeah. Uh, it's, not, it's an honor to be even, even to be allowed access to the pipeline. Yeah. And no, who knows why? Yeah. Who knows why or... Yeah. or uh, or why it's me and not the guy down the street. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that it has something to do with that four-year-old listening to Brahms, you know, that, that, uh, that set the wheels in motion for your journey to chase that experience. 
Yeah, I guess so. I guess so. Um, let me ask you about the transition from serving the song, serving the band, being honored to have that role, to being a band leader. So what was that? What was that transition transition like? I, I'm not, I am not really a band leader. <laughs> Jerry once said he thought of himself as a signpost to new spaces. And then in a famous old interview, yeah, from the '60s, and uh, I kind of feel like that sometimes too. It, it rather, uh, I, uh, rather, uh, rather than leading, my I, uh, my role is to demonstrate or to show. Like, here's an open door. Mm -hmm. Let's go through it. Oh, you don't want to go through that? Here's another one. It's an, in, it's or an this, invitation. Or, 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 or I'll copy what somebody else is playing, and we'll go through that door. Mm -hmm. It's more like an invitation yes. than leading, yeah. yeah. But you do attract a wide array of great musicians, because they, yeah. they all recognize that's, that opportunity, right? A, yeah, because I, I like to let them play whatever they have ah. <laughs> you know? and, and they never disappoint me. Yeah. You know? And you also have one of the great honors in life, which is making music with your kids. Yeah, that, that, that's, that really is uh, kind of the pinnacle, really, and especially when it happens at that level. You yeah, know. Uh, you can share that. There's, a, there's, a, there's, an, extra, there's an extra color and, and uh, warmth to it. You know. Yeah, As, in terms of family communication, to be able to share that, is is uh, yeah, you you end, you end up knowing each other better, yeah, than you you might ordinarily you know without yeah. that experience. That's well put. Strangely, uh, strangely, strangly because it's it's like there's nothing, no concrete information is exchanged. You know, right? It's just the the mesh. It's like uh, taking taking a trip together, taking a journey together. You know, yeah. you, you share that experience. Yeah. Yes. Um, Mike wants to know, are there common pitfalls and trappings you tend to notice in younger bands? And are there newer artists that inspire you deeply? Oh, dear. Well, here's an easier one. Okay. What advice would you give young musicians? <laughs> Eyes full of wonder. Uh, listen, 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 listen. And listen some more. Yeah. And and don't just listen to one part. Listen to the whole flow. And Charlie Mingus used to say, "Focus in front of the music, so you can so you can see the relationship, the the relationships of all the parts to each other." Mm -hmm. How did that work for you on stage, especially in the early days of the Grateful Dead? Um, could you hear everybody? I made, uh, you know, I made it so I, I, I made it so I could. You yeah. Know, I, I, I spent half my time, <laughs> half my time on stage or at, at rehearsals, making making sure that every everybody could hear everybody. Yeah. Because that was the key to the to, right. to the band, you know. Yeah. That's a, that's interesting. Was there? Um, when you're thinking about transitioning from one song to the next in a medley, when they're when the song uh -huh. naturally morphs from one place to another, mm -hmm. was that sometimes premeditated or or following a set list, or you knew kind sometimes, of where? Sometimes there's a set list. Yeah. And uh, but the set list will be like islands in, in a archipelago, and the, yeah. the transitions will be the current that flows between them. Yeah. And the, the current is not specified. Yeah. You know, that, that is totally uh, uh, free. Yeah. So we'll, uh, it will depart from one island song and go in, uh, and f flow into the infinite current and see where it takes us. Yeah. And uh, it may take us to the next song or it may, it may take us to another song that's not on the set list, yeah. uh, which has happened. Or, or just a, a groove of some kind yes, that's completely or, separate and distinct. Yeah, yeah. or, or I mean, not another song. Yeah, you know, just a. Just well, it, it's interesting because, um, you know, normally I might ask someone, 
like you, what's left on your bucket list? You know, what's left musically that's, that's, that's not done? But I think in this case, we know because the, the bucket list is that peak experience. Yeah. And that's, that's it. <laughs> it's been the same. <laughs> you're going you're gonna to yeah. chase it and you're going to find it sometimes and sometimes you won't, but that's, yeah. that's it, right? Yeah. What, what did uh, Carl Willenda say about uh, his, his uh, he, you know, the trapeze the, the artist? Willendas, yeah. Yeah. He says, the wire is life. Everything else is just waiting around. Yeah. Yeah. There's a there's a touch of that with in in this as well. Of course, yeah. Well, thank you so much for sharing those insights with me today, and oh, and uh, for being here here at Etim. <laughs> Next time you talk to Mike, tell him thanks for the question. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he got a great. couple of good ones in there. Yeah, yeah he sure did. <laughs> okay. He almost came out to do the interview. <laughs> I told him this was happening, and I said, "Why don't you come out?" And he said, "Let me explore." So that was just a few days ago. <laughs> That would have been great. Yeah. On the day that I was born, my dad sat down and cried. I had the mark just as plain as day, it could not be denied. See that Cain caught Abel Rolling, loaded, died He suspends behind his ear And him not thinking twice They have to step a Mississippi up down To the loop Hello baby, I'm gone goodbye up a rock and ride Farewell to you all southern skies I'm on my way On my way I 
build a retread to my feet and pray better weather. Half a step from Mississippi up town. Hello, baby, I'm gone. Goodbye. Have a cup of rock and roll. Farewell to you, all southern skies. I'm on my way. On my way. On my way. Hi again. Good to see you. Yeah, Good to you see too. you back here at E-Town Hall. It's good to be back. Yeah, you were here with the Capitol Sunrays, right? I was. Right before the before the pandemic times. Yes, indeed. Yeah. Indeed, our, like, 10th show ever. Yeah. And one of our last, but who knows? Yeah. Not forever. It was a great example of um, pulling people from disparate backgrounds and putting together and finding a body of work to aim towards. It was cool seeing what you put together. Absolutely. Yeah. And I, I think I was the last piece of that one. Yeah. That was a Luther Dickinson um, composition, as it were. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I guess he... Uh, I was actually watching one of his interviews from probably this exact room from that... Um, uh, again, and he said that, yeah, his purpose was to get our friend Amy Helm together with uh, Birds of Chicago, our yeah. friends JT and Allie. Yeah. And uh, yeah, made made for a great record. And then they toured on it. And one of those those tour dates was opening for us at the Capitol Theater. Oh, cool. And they didn't have a bass player. Um, <laughs> and so I think Amy just texted me. It was like, you want to play bass on two songs? And then I got there for, uh, and I said, yes. I got there for sound check and it was like, well, what about these songs too? And yeah. these songs. And yeah. then by the end of the the fairly quick set, it was, well, this is the last show of your run. Do you want to just get in the van? So, oh, that's great. Yeah. I love when that happens. Yes. It was uh it was a a, a very nice uh coming together of a lot of people that we were, you know, 
dear friends with, but uh, also some new, new friends as well. I mentioned that Luther had a situation where his bass player's flight was yep. canceled and he called me and said, can you come and play bass with us? Yep. In that case, it was no rehearsal and, and play the show, but it yep. was, that was great. Yep. Um, well, let's talk a little bit about um, just growing up around this scene that was both really well-defined, you know, the Grateful yeah. Dead scene that you grew up in were sort of welcomed into the into um, was pretty well defined when you were a little kid. Oh yeah, but at the same time, the as I was talking about with your dad, the um, the chasing of the magic was both elusive and intangible, and you were introduced to that as well. Yeah, um, I mean. My experiences when I was very young around the Grateful Dead, um, you know, ended when I was eight um, because that's when Jerry yeah. died. That's how old I was. Um, so, you know, it's it's not that different than the Brahms that you were listening to, that my dad was listening to when he was four. It's just this music was all around me. Yeah. And so there was always going to be a, something... That was, was something that I was always going to be yeah. involved in, not by any pressure or for any, you know, you got to do this, but right. um, just uh, it was always going to be a part of my life for sure. Um, How old were you when you imagined you would be playing music with your dad? Um, well, the first show, I think we, well, the first time I think we played together was at a high school talent show. And we played Sugar Magnolia um, with some friends, me and two other buddies. Yeah. And then we needed a bass player. <laughs> <laughs> and actually, I think uh, I think you brought Bobby and Natasha yeah. to that. And Bob said that was one of the uh, most energetic. I forget what the adjective he used was, but <laughs> it was a it was a fast version. Oh, cool! Um, I was a lot of youthful energy. Yeah, yeah, for sure. You know, sixteen year olds <laughs> or whatever. Um, but you know, I didn't really. I had bands. I was in college, um, and then in my professional life um, outside of music, after college, and um, I had bands. We did played a lot uh, of music all over the place, but I didn't really think it would be my, the thing I would do kind of full time right. until my folks opened Terrapin Crossroads. And then they just needed music played at the bar at Terrapin Crossroads every night. And I was very happy to, yeah. to be a part of that with my brother and all of our friends and, and my dad coming down all the time and, yeah. and just jamming with us. And that sort of opened the door for all of, all of us to, yeah, to but... really dig deep into all these repertoires and learn to be to learn what we should be chasing yeah um in that no, sort of you, way that that built a beautiful community yeah turpin crossroads built a beautiful Absolutely. community let me just ask you about the burden of being phil lesh's kid yeah. so when you're when you're imagining uh being a uh a musician in college yeah and then all your buddies find out oh yeah that's who your dad is okay mm -hmm. So let's talk about that. Just does it does it shrink the window of opportunity for you in terms of what styles of music you're going to play? No, I never really thought of it that way. Though in college, I definitely like wasn't playing jam band or Grateful Dead style music. Um, yeah, uh, you know, our, uh, I was in all kinds of different bands, and they all played different different types of of genres, but you know, never really in that particular vein that I opened myself up to a little later. Um, but no, I've, I've never thought of it as a burden. It can um, be heavy though. It can be heavy to be the son of someone famous. Yeah, absolutely. It can be the but, child of somebody famous can yeah. be, a, can be a thing you people, people wear well, uh, yeah. some, some better than others. Well, I hope, I hope I wear it well. I, I simply think of myself as very lucky, like in not kind of all ways, you know, um, to be, Born where I was, I mean, I love California and the Bay Area. Um, to the parents that I was born to, to have the brother and the friends that I do, and the bandmates and the musicians yeah. that I know. Um, so I just think of myself as very l blessed and totally. lucky to yeah. for everything. And I, 
Uh, yeah, I, I just don't think of it as a burden. I, I understand that it can be for some, yeah. some people, but you know, our situation, everyone's situation is a little different. And, totally. and for me, it's, it's kind of all just been, been good. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, you me. know, the other thing is that a lot of families and particularly, um, you know, these days, as, as the country becomes more and more secular, at least in some parts of the country, um, there is an absence of that sort of spiritual tradition that a lot of families mm. relied on or, right. or came to be familiar with. But I suspect that in your case, that was very present. There was that because because what we were discussing about chasing that moment and finding a um, that peak experience where you sort of disappear in the music, yeah, that is fundamentally a spiritual. Quest. Oh, absolutely, yeah, yeah. yeah I, I mean, I I have personally never been very religious or uh, you know traditionally spiritual, but yeah. I definitely think of places like I mean, I, I don't think it's a mistake that E-Town Hall is a former church. Um, I f feel like places like Levon Helms Barn and, yeah. and Terrapin, you know, were places of some spiritual connection totally. for sure. Yeah. Um, in whatever well, you know, way I can understand it. You yeah. Know? And we live in these crazy times where yeah. there's such divisiveness yeah. and such um, a lack of sympathy and understanding um, among people who should know better. Yes. Um, and we've been shown that music can bring people together. Oh, absolutely. And in some ways, it's one of the very few things that can. Yeah. So there's a, there's a great opportunity that we all have. Yeah, absolutely. And, and a, you know, a responsibility, a too, responsibility I think. Too, yeah. yeah. You know, which obviously with E-Town and everything you do outside of music is, is something that I know you, you're focused on. But yeah, I mean, it's just a gathering place and yeah. anyone can gather, you know, yeah. at, a, at a live show, you know, yeah. um, well, yeah. Graham, do love live music. Thanks <laughs> for, thanks for sharing that. And thanks for, you know, coming back to E-Town and, yeah. and congratulations on finding yourself in Thank an you. environment where you get to make music with a lot of people, yes. including your dad. Uh, especially. Yeah. <laughs> yes, cool. exactly. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Let's play some music.
Texas, fourth day of July. Sun so high and the clouds so low, the eagles fill the sky. And catch the Detroit lining out of Santa Fe. Shine from sea to shine and sea. Gotta go to Tulsa, just when we can ride. Gotta sell one old scar, one small point of pride. There ain't no place to make an eye. Him from the sun Ain't no bed can give us rest now And keep us on the 